despite the fact that Australia is just 1% of global emissions. This is not me denying climate change, its existence or human involvement in it. You can't have 8 billion people on the planet without doing something to the atmosphere. But Australia is 1%, 1 percent of global emissions. Here's a helpful graph to remind you of how we compare to the rest of the world. As I've shown you, this, by the way, comes from the Union of Concerned Scientists, not the right-wing think tank. China is about a third of what the world has to deal with right now. The third world is, again, a significant number, as is Russia and India. Yes, the United States a big picture in it, but Australia is the one that absolutely must do something. Despite the fact that, as I've told you a trillion times before, Australia, even if we stopped everything and we went back to whatever green dream Adam Bant may have in the middle of the night, the pollution that comes out of China would replace everything Australia does in one year in 16 days. That was the IPA with their study a couple of years ago. And despite the fact that it is China who is building more coal-fired power plants and in actual fact is responsible for 95% of all new coal-fire power construction in 2023, it is Australia who absolutely must solve the climate crisis. 1% of the climate crisis. Now, in 2019, Australians went, no, 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 43%, sorry, 45% target of Bill Shorten, that's too much. But then, because our interest, because our power bills were going to fall by $275 and hundreds of thousands of new jobs would be created, apparently just 2%, three years later, was the perfect place where Anthony Albanese was able to get himself elected. Of course, the Dutton opposition says they're not going to play the 2030 game because the main game is net zero by 2050. But there is something that happens between 2030, which is the 43% mark, and net zero of 2050. And that is countries like Australia having to go even deeper, even harder, on the expectations of climate cuts for 2035. Now, interestingly, we read today that the announcement from the Albanese government may well conveniently be delayed until potentially after the election about just how high that target will move from 43%, and in part, that's because we're standing by to see what's happening in the United States. Now, let's be very clear. Kamala Harris is part of an administration that has gone hard trying to push down numbers when it comes to the climate emissions of the United States. Trump would pull out of the Paris Agreement because China is not held to the same account as the United States. And China produces more pollution than the United States. So obviously, who ends up winning that election will matter because 1% of the world deciding to go hard when half of the world isn't, well, you see the problem there because you see the atmosphere is global, not just local. We can't solve the weather here in Australia. But to give you an idea of if this government goes into a minority after the next election and then they will have to set a target after the next election, these are the targets that the people who will hold together the parliament, the Greens and the Teals, would demand by 2035. They don't want the Greens net zero by 2050, they want it by 2035. The Teals don't want 43% by 2030, they want it to be amped to 75% by 2035. That minority government is seemingly inevitable as Labor's two-party preferred vote falls and their primary vote falls. So the likelihood or the best case scenario for Labor is to pretend that they don't have a target going into 2035, to have an election in 2025, and then because the Greens tell them they have to do it or they'll lose government, producing a number way wilder than anything that Australians have been willing to accept at a ballot box any time in Australian political history. Nothing to see here, right? That's why your vote matters. That's why your preferences matter too.